Hello and welcome to the lecture for Module 9 on the rise of Islam. As always, I'll start by showing you the lecture outline where we're going um, to start with some introductory comments but then go through the geography of the Arabian Peninsula where Islam originates. Then we'll look at the origins of Islam with the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the expansion of Islam following his death, uh, and then we'll talk about how Islam develops as a world system and that, that continues to expand even after the fall of the Islamic empires. And then <coughs> here are the IDs for the module. We're going to look at the Prophet Muhammad, the Hijra, Quran, the Five Pillars of Islam, the Kaaba, and then talk about the Islamic world system, that sort of last part of the lecture. So make sure that you have um, some, the lecture to refer to as I go through through the lecture. Oh, sorry. Let me hold on before I go on to that slide. <laughs> All right, I want to make a few introductory comments then. Uh, the rise, well, so today we're looking at the rise of Islam. And Islam then is the third of the three monotheistic religions that we've looked at in this class. The first two being Judaism and then Christianity. Uh, and Islam, as I'll talk about more in a minute, was uh, developed out of a basis of Judaism and Christianity in a similar way to Christianity, which developed out of a sort of a platform or a basis of Judaism. Christianity, I'm sorry, Islam does the same thing. It, it is sort of a third religion to come out of these this monotheistic idea that has, again, a, a Judaic and a Christian base. So it's the third of the three monotheisms in the class and also we're going to continue the themes of the relationship between empire and trade, particularly when we look at the expansion of Islam here in the second or third part of the lecture and then Islam as a world system and the kinds of um, exchanges that took place within the Islamic world. So again, um, reprising those themes of the relationship between religion, trade, and empire. Although what we'll see for Islam, which is different from Christianity, uh, is that Islam was the basis for imperial unity and imperial expansion. Whereas with Christianity, we saw that it, it arose in part of the Roman Empire, but originally, uh, when it first develops, the Romans really reject it and, and persecute the Christians, and only later does it become a state religion. It takes about 300 years. Um, before Christianity is accepted by the Roman imperial rulers and then actually taken on as, as the state kind of official religion. We'll see with Islam from the very beginning it is the basis for the state and for the expansion of that state um, as, it, as it expands into an empire. So some, some pretty significant similarities but also some significant differences as we'll see throughout the lecture too. So I want to return then to that, uh, to the issue of kind of the the Christian and Judaic basis of Islam. Um, basically, Islam builds upon Christianity and Judaism, and throughout history, as uh, in the Islamic empires in the Islamic world, historically, you often saw a lot of um, respect and tolerance that Muslims demonstrated toward Christians and Jews they referred to them as peoples of the book and often were, as I said, quite tolerant of Christians and Jews. So why was that the case? Um, basically, Christians, Jews, and Muslims share the same God. So Yahweh, who was the God of the ancient Hebrews, is the same historic entity as the God of the Christians. This is the same God referred to in the Ten Commandments, uh, Yahweh and God. And that same entity is also Allah for Muslims. So historically, this is the same God. And in fact, Yahweh, Allah, and God basically all mean God. So Yahweh and Allah are, are, um, are the words for God in Arabic and in Hebrew. I've had students in the past say to me, you know, how can you possibly say that, that this is the same God? We don't 
you know, Christians don't worship the same God as Muslims. And I'm not trying to say that the meaning of Allah and the meaning of God for Muslims and Christians, respectively, is exactly the same thing. Um, I think your religion is very much a personal matter. But historically, and through the historical documents, this is the same entity. Uh, and another thing that Christians, Muslims, and Jews share are a number of the same sacred books. Just like you saw with Christians, that, that the Bible consists of the Old Testament and the New Testament, where the Old Testament is actually the writings of the Hebrew prophets. Um, it's basically the Torah, which is a sacred book for the Jews. So the Christians um, incorporated uh, sacred Jewish writings with the writings of the New Testament that um, basically recount the life and the teachings of, of Jesus and his apostles and put them together in the Bible. So in this way in Christianity you have the sacred books, I'm sorry, the sacred book of the Bible includes Jewish sacred books as well. You have the same thing in Islam where um, Muslims very much respect and hold sacred the Old and the New Testament They've also added then another sacred book, the Quran, which is basically the teachings of Muhammad that were written down uh, after his death. So in that way then, Islam also incorporates the sacred books of Christianity and Judaism. Finally, these three religions also share the same prophets. They recognize Abraham, Moses and Jesus as important prophets in their religious history. These are figures to whom God spoke directly and Muslims recognize this and very much respect this. But they also have added a fourth prophet which is Muhammad and who according to Muslims um, God spoke directly to Muhammad and so he has become than a fourth prophet, and for Muslims, he's the final prophet. There's, there are going to be no more prophets after Muhammad. He is, he is Allah's fourth and final prophet. And according to Islam, then, it is to Muhammad that God revealed his full revelation. And so only Muslims know kind of the full story. If you're a Christian or a Jew, you got part of the story but you don't have the full story. So in that sense, again, um, the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's fourth and final prophet to whom the full revelation of God's word was given. So again, some very sig significant similarities, but also some very significant differences. So before we move into then the geography of Arabia, I just want to go through a few definitions that we'll be using um, throughout the lecture. The word Islam means submission to Allah. A Muslim is one who submits. And then the Ummah is the name for the Muslim community, the sort of the global Muslim community. Anyone who is a Muslim belongs to this Ummah, this sort of global Ummah within, within the world. Okay. So moving on to geography then, uh, Islam originated in the Arabian Peninsula, which is located between uh, North Africa and the Middle East, or is basically a sort of a part of the Middle East, but it's in this area of that, that crossroads of the world uh, that we talked about with the ancient Hebrews and that we also um, sort of touched on with the Silk Roads as well. It is a place where, oh, it's also the place where uh, Moses led his people out of Egypt and where God spoke to Moses, according to the Hebrew uh, traditions, at Mount Sinai. This is where God revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses. So this is a very important part of the world for the history of Judaism and Christianity as well as Islam. It is largely comprised of desert. It's a very dry area for the most part, uh, and it's a very hot place, so it has a, a very harsh climate, 
and relatively little agriculture throughout most of the peninsula, but there are some exceptions to this. In the southern area, down here around Yemen, there's actually plenty of rainfall and quite a bit of, of agriculture. And then throughout the peninsula, you also have oasis towns. If you remember the definition of oasis towns from when we talked about the Silk Roads, these are places with access to water that became important areas for exchange and trade that had important markets and bazaars and were connected into trade routes. I'll talk more about that in, a, in just a second. Um, but two very important uh, oasis towns, or basically trading cities, were Medina and Mecca. And they're going to play an important part of the story of the development of Islam, the origins of Islam. But given the harsh desert-like um, environment of the Arabian Peninsula, it was largely inhabited by pastoralists. It could not support widespread agriculture throughout most of the peninsula. So you see a population that's dominated by pastoralists that still exist to this day, uh, people called Bedouins. I'll show you, oh, I'll show you some Bedouins in just a second. Here's a um, a map, a modern day map of the Arabian Peninsula so you can see the various countries that um, that are now located on the Arabian Peninsula and where it is in relation to Iraq, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Iran, etc. And then again you can see Medina and Mecca here on this map. Here's a satellite image of the Arabian Peninsula which shows the very dry desert-like conditions throughout most of the peninsula you can see here. And then these sort of green, more fertile areas um, to the south, the southern um, parts of the peninsula. And then here's an image of the Arabian Desert just to give you a sense again of those sort of dry, arid, um, hot conditions of the desert. So as I said, it, it's inhabited largely by um, Bedouin pastoralists uh, throughout its history. And here is an image of some Bedouin pastoralists in sort of a caravan uh, across the desert. And these Bedouins are organized, uh, were and are organized largely according to, to tribes and tribal relations, which are basically kinship groups. And historically, there was often very fierce competition between these between different tribal groups over natural resources and in particular uh, over access to water. Um, access to water in an environment like this can literally mean life and death and would often lead to bitter struggles among the tribes. So tribal relations are a very important part of Bedouin and then Islamic history. But despite the harsh climate Oh, actually, sorry, let me show you some more Bedouin. So these are some Bedouin sheep farmers in the present day. Um, Bedouin tents, again, pastoralist peoples, so that they're portable tents. And, um, okay, so you've got this, this harsh climate, but despite the harsh climate, this part of the world, as I said just a second ago, has extreme importance in world history. And we talked about this with the Silk Roads and again with the ancient Hebrews, but this part of the world is really part of that crossroads between East and West that we talked about, where you have really important trade routes going through this area. And so despite the harsh climate of the Arabian Peninsula, it was a key position for trade. And so you get um, a juxtaposition of this pastoralist lifestyle with this very urban kind of cosmopolitan lifestyle that was linked in with trade uh, across Afro-Eurasia. On the one hand, the Arabian Peninsula then links, helps to link these overland routes between East and West. Uh, you've got uh, links between then North Africa here and the Middle East. So it links basically North Africa with Mesopotamia. It also links then Mesopotamia North and North Africa with Europe. So you have this literally this sort of crossroads taking place here. In terms of the sea routes, the Arabian Peninsula is also uh, surrounded by the Persian Gulf over here. 
uh, the Indian Ocean, and then the Red Sea here. And so it was a very important area for these sea routes of the Silk Roads as well. And basically it linked the Indian Ocean trade routes with the Mediterranean over here. So again, it's very important kind of crossroads place of um, trade, very ancient, uh, an area where a lot of very ancient trade routes developed. So this has two main effects. On the one hand, you end up, as I said a minute, a minute ago, with this kind of strange juxtaposition, or I shouldn't say strange, but unusual juxtaposition between pastoralist peoples, pastoralists basically um, sheep herders, um, with this very sophisticated urban culture, and this kind of urban cosmopolitan culture. So on the one hand, you've got this um, this pastoralist population, and on the other hand, you have these oasis towns that have import, very important fairs, very important markets and bazaars, where you've got lots of different cultures coming in. So very sophisticated, very cosmopolitan. Another effect of this has to do with what we talked about with the Silk Roads in the, um, the module on the Silk Roads, which is the fact that over these trade routes you have not only goods traveling but also lots of ideas as we said also diseases um, styles of art styles of architecture there's a, a lot of blending of cultures that idea of syncretism that we talked about so you also see this in the Arabian Peninsula particularly in the cities and this is important because both the pastoralist peoples and the urban peoples of the Arabian Peninsula would have had contact with a number of different religions and particularly with Christianity and Judaism with both which both originated very close to this area and in which um, you would have seen a lot of merchants and travelers who were Jews and Christians so people living in the Arabian Peninsula would have had a lot of exposure to Judaism and to Christianity uh, the average merchant, say, living in Mecca in the Arabian Peninsula, would have been very familiar with Judaism and Christianity and would have come into contact, regular contact, with Jews and Christians. Uh, and so a religion that would come out of the Arabian Peninsula, it would make sense that it would have elements of Christianity and Judaism as well, that you would see a blending of these traditions within this religion. And this is just what you see. Um, the Prophet Muhammad was a merchant in the city of Mecca and, who was exposed to Christianity and Judaism and the religion that develops from his revelations again has elements of these religions within it. And alongside these monotheistic religions in the Arabian Peninsula you also had a number of um, Bedouins and pa the pastoralist Bedouins as well as a number of people in the urban environments as well people that lived in the cities um, they practiced a polytheistic religion which has similar qualities to other religions we've looked at in this class in which you had um, polytheistic worship of a number of gods that represented natural things and in this case particularly there were a number of, of important sort of desert gods and goddesses as well as a whole um, cornucopia of different angels and demons that also came from Zoroastrian influences in Persia. Don't worry about that. We're not really talking much about Zoroastrianism in this class. But again, you can see the influences of the, the Persian religion um, coming into the Arabian Peninsula. But they had a number of shrines in the cities where people could go and worship these desert gods and goddesses, often by offering sacrifices, giving offerings to these gods. So you have again this kind of juxtaposition of a pastoralist and an urban lifestyle and then along with that a juxtaposition of um, this sort of polytheistic religion worshiping desert gods and goddesses at, at shrines and temples along with then these uh, monotheistic religions of Christianity and Judaism and then as we're going to see the development of Islam as well so interesting just juxtapositions uh, within the Arabian Peninsula. 
So I'm just going to show a few more slides to kind of illustrate this, these points I've just been making. Uh, you can see here a number of overland trade routes within the Arabian Peninsula. And you can see that these trade routes connect these, these different cities together. And these different cities then would be important trading cities within the, the traditional kind of Silk Road's trade routes. So you can see these overland trade routes. And then here are um, the sea routes that connect uh, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, or um, basically the Indian Ocean, and then the Red Sea here. So these are, again, uh, a, a variety of, of sea routes that kind of surround the peninsula. And you can see, again, how important the peninsula is to this trade. And then also how important these uh, port cities are. There's a number of really um, major port cities that develop along the coast of the Arabian Peninsula as well. For those of you that have served in Iraq, this area is probably very familiar. At this stage, now the, um, the Red Sea is now actually connected to the Mediterranean by the Suez Canal. So you can actually sail straight through the Mediterranean into the Red Sea. But prior to the building of the Suez Canal in the late 19th century, you can see it the, they were not connected. There, was, um, there would have to be some sort of portage uh, across land to get to the Mediterranean. I'll show you. You can see that again here. There's just this little area here uh, of where you would have to have overland transport between the Red Sea here and the Mediterranean. But now the Suez Canal actually co connects these. Um, so moving on, here's another slide showing you a variety of land and sea routes that crisscross the Arabian Peninsula. Really important incense trade that went on between East Africa um, and, and the Arabian Peninsula, uh, where a lot of um, basically frankincense and myrrh traveled along this what was called the incense road into to Europe uh, and then also to the east. And then one final slide showing you that what happens once these goods get into the Mediterranean, the number of, of crisscrossing trade routes that, uh, that went through the Mediterranean as well. This is actually useful to show for Greece and Italy with the, the Roman Empire that we've talked about in past modules to show how they become interconnected into this Mediterranean trade. And then what we'll see in module 11 is the addition of the Iberian Peninsula into this. So here's the Iberian Peninsula and the number of trade routes that it kind of connects with the Mediterranean. Okay, uh, and then so just one last shot looking at the Arabian Peninsula and where it's located. So as I said a couple minutes ago then, this is a place where you would see Christians and Jews traveling um, and bringing in kind of religious influences and certainly influenced uh, a man who was to become a, a, a huge figure in the history of uh, Islam, the origins of Islam, who was a merchant in Mecca and he was um, a man named Muhammad. So Muhammad then was born in the year 570 and he lives until the year uh, 632 AD. He was the son of merchants in Mecca and became a merchant himself. He was orphaned at a very early age and was raised by his uncle and his grandfather. And in this kind of tribal society, to be an orphan was actually could be very difficult because you wouldn't necessarily have the access to um, the resources that the tribe could, could get you. Uh, it was a very um, many people say that, that Muhammad had a relatively difficult childhood because of being orphaned at a young age. At any rate, he becomes a merchant uh, and he begins to work for a woman named uh, Kaditha, it's K-A-D-I-T-H-A, who was a wealthy merchant in the city of Mecca and eventually they get married, uh, which helps to raise his status and his wealth. Um, but even with having a relatively prominent place within the city <coughs> of Mecca, his was not a particularly noticeable life until he was about 40 years old. And when Muhammad was 
around the age of 40, he began to have dreams. And in these dreams, so he said, the angel Gabriel, who was a messenger angel, or was and is a messenger angel in um, Christian theology, the angel Gabriel came to him and began to give him God's message. And in these dreams, then, Gabriel told him that God has, had chosen him to spread his message to the world. And so Gabriel began to tell Muhammad this message, and again with the idea that then Muhammad needed to go out and, and spread this word. So what was the message that Gabriel was bringing to Allah? Basically, I mean, what was what was the message that Gabriel was bringing to Muhammad? Uh, basically, it was had uh, three main tenets. One was that there is only one true God, and that God is Allah. That Allah ruled the universe, and that worshiping any other gods was evil. So you needed to be monotheistic and worship Allah only. And this probably will sound familiar based on what you know about Judaism and Christianity. Also, uh, Gabriel told Muhammad, again this is sort of God's word through Gabriel, he told Muhammad that there would be a judgment day that would come in which Allah would reward his followers and punish the wicked. And finally he told Muhammad that Muhammad was God's prophet and that Muhammad would be the fourth and final prophet so that only the followers of Muhammad would know the full extent of God's message and there would be no other prophets following following Muhammad. So God was not going to come down and speak to anybody else uh, ever again. Uh, and so Muhammad goes out and starts to tell people what he's dreamed. And before I go into the reaction to that I'll just uh, show you here this is actually a page of the Quran which is um, the the writings of Muhammad's teachings after he died his followers write down what it is that he said what it is that he taught through his dreams what was revealed to him in his dreams so this is his his first revelation and you can see here uh, this is a, then a drawing of, of Muhammad here and then this is the angel Gabriel coming and talking to him oh let me go back there for a second okay so Muhammad uh, has these dreams and he begins to tell people about these dreams and at first nobody believes him his wife does believe him very early on <coughs> but virtually nobody else and they people start to people think he's kind of crazy and they don't they don't understand why he's you know this upstanding merchant is suddenly come going and talking about all this crazy stuff but over time he begins to convince people he he speaks in such a beautiful poetic way uh, based upon what he's heard in his dreams and he talks about very deep complex issues so much so that people begin to be convinced by him and they begin to follow him and little by little he begins to attract a large following uh, and as his following begins to grow many people in the city of Mecca begin to resent him so let me show you here again. So this is Mecca. This is where Muhammad is from, and this is this um, trading, important trading city that that we're talking about on the Arabian Peninsula. So, as I said, many people begin to be threatened by Muhammad. They're sort of uh, scared of the amount of influence that he's got. Um, the commercial and political leaders in the town uh, are afraid that he's going to want to take over the city. They find his message to be subversive. Uh, they are afraid that Muhammad is going to, going to try to take over. They are very offended when Muhammad says that they're wicked for worshiping their gods. Because if you remember, this is a largely polytheistic society that's worshiping a number of, of, um, of sort of desert gods. And Muhammad is saying, no, you can't worship these gods anymore that's evil you need to worship Allah only and if you do that then you will be judged to be righteous but if you're going to be worshiping your desert god still then you're evil and sinful 
so that this really offends a lot of the town leaders. Uh, the religious leaders are especially upset because they're afraid that the gods that they're worshiping are going to retaliate if they're not giving offerings and sacrifices at the temples. They're afraid that they're going to um, have some sort of retaliation, that these gods aren't going to protect them from natural disasters anymore. Also, these religious leaders managed the temples for these various gods, and it, this was very lucrative for them. Um, if you think back to uh, Mesopotamia, we talked about this, that um, the leaders, the religious leaders, the priests of the temples would actually could grow very wealthy uh, from the offerings that people would give. This is the same that we saw with the Brahmins in the Vedic religion. So this is kind of a similar dynamic happening here where you've got these leaders of these religious temples, these religious leaders who have this very lucrative um, practice going on of managing the temples and they're afraid that they're going to lose revenue if nobody's coming and giving offerings at the temples anymore there there goes their their livelihood basically so they're afraid the gods are going to retaliate they're also afraid they're going to lose their livelihood so things begin to get more and more tense in Mecca as as Muhammad gets more and more followers to the point where Muhammad and his followers decide that they need to leave Mecca and this is about 622 AD they decide that they need to leave Mecca and they go to the city of Medina and this is a journey that is called the Hijra so let me go back for a second and show you again here's Mecca and here's Medina and so basically they travel from Mecca to Medina. It's about 200 miles north of Mecca. Um, they go to Medina and they establish a religious community there and Muhammad becomes the political and religious leader of these, this group of people following him and they grow more and more powerful in, in Medina and these people who follow him then recognize him as, as Allah's prophet, as God's prophet. Uh, but the, I want to just pause for a second and talk about the Hijra, though, and its its great importance and significance for uh, the history of Islam. Because the Hijra is actually considered to be the the start of the Islamic community, the Ummah that we talked about a few minutes ago. This is really when um, the Islamic community is is considered to have originated. So the origins of Islam are usually dated at 622 AD, not the year of Muhammad's birth, around 570, but in 622. Because this is the first time that these believers of Muhammad and of the revelations of Muhammad and the worshipers of Allah, this is the first time that they're acting as a united group and that they're united by religious belief rather than by tribal identity, rather than by, uh, by kinship identity. They are joining together based on their religious belief rather than um, any kind of, of family or kinship ties. And so this is considered the start of the Islamic Ummah, the, the Islamic community. So back to the story then. The, um, um, Muhammad and his followers are basically the Muslims, this, this Ummah, this Muslim community. Uh, they're in Medina now and they stay there <coughs> for several years and while they're in Medina Muhammad continues to gain more and more followers more and more uh, supporters and eventually the community becomes so powerful that they decide to return to Mecca and to um, try to defeat basically the religious and political leaders of Mecca and have them submit to Islam so in the year 630 they return to Mecca and they attack and overtake the city and while this is certainly um, you know a battle and there's violence and fighting when Muhammad is successful there's actually very little retribution and they the Muslim community shows quite a bit of sort of benevolence to the people of Mecca um, they don't sort of carry out tortures or, or major punishments on the people they've defeated but they do force everybody to become Muslim they do take over the city and they go around the city and they destroy all of the shrines and temples to the, the polytheistic gods except for one 
so they've made Islam basically the official religion of the city everybody has to become Muslim they destroy the shine the the all the shrines all except one which is called the Kaaba now that's one of your um, one of your IDs so it's K A apostrophe B A so what was the Kaaba the Kaaba was the largest shrine in Mecca and in it there was a huge black rock that was thought to sort of represent a particularly important desert god that had was thought to have originally uh, come from Abraham sort of the patriarch of the the Israelites so again you can see that connection and so it was basically the most important shrine in the city and Muhammad actually preserves that shrine he, he doesn't have that shrine destroyed and then he goes and he makes a symbolic pilgrimage around the Kaaba he walks around this huge black rock seven times and he does this in order to symbolize that Islam or the Muslim community has now overtaken the former kind of polytheistic or what they would call idolatrous evil religion of the Arabian Peninsula so it's to symbolize the takeover of um, the the original religion or the polytheistic worship of the Arabians with Islam and I'll show you some pictures of the Kaaba in a few minutes because it's come to have enormous symbolic significance for Muslims but anyway at this point I just want to show you one more slide this is a, a slide uh, in Arabic that shows then the journey from uh, from Mecca to Medina in the north and then back again um, when they embark on the Hijra and then when they come back to Mecca in 630 and are able to take over uh, then in the year 632 Muhammad dies but by that point the Islamic community has spread throughout the Arabian Peninsula so it actually quite quickly spreads out of Medina and Mecca and is able to cover the entire peninsula by 632 AD and you can see that in this slide right here the dark purple area then here represents the Muslim community or the Ummah up to the time of Muhammad's death so a relatively quick um, spread but we're gonna see in a few minutes that the expansion of Islam is actually uh, even more explosive than that um, but for now just worry about this dark purple area this is all we're worried about for the moment so this is the spread of Islam up to the death of Muhammad in 632 AD um, so now I want to take a minute and then talk about the teachings of Muhammad uh, by first looking at uh, the sacred texts uh, the sort of the writings of, of Islam the written beliefs and then also the practices of Islam so there are three main sources or written sources that provide the basis for Islam uh, the most important of which is called the Quran which was written down between about the 630s and the 650s AD and these this the Quran is made up of the sayings of Muhammad which came from Allah through the angel Gabriel so like Jesus Muhammad did not write down his own words he didn't write down his own revelations um, or what Allah said to him but his followers did so over time and actually quite quickly after his death um, his his followers began to write down what his sayings and teachings had been throughout his life uh, I think the same thing is true of Confucius actually too he didn't write it down it was his students his disciples that wrote wrote down his sayings as well in the Analects that you read so again you can see sort of a, a common theme among these religions and philosophies um, anyway so by the 650s then the Quran has basically been been written out and it's very similar to the Ten Commandments in that this is considered the Word of God the writings in the Quran are considered the direct word of God given to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel so I guess not quite so direct but is about as direct as you can get um, within these monotheistic religions 
um, anyway, so it's considered the 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 word of God. That's the really important thing. This is this is God speaking. When you read the Quran, these are the words of God speaking. And for that reason, there's only one official version of the Quran. There's only one sort of official interpretation of the words. Uh, and nobody doubts or questions that this is the word of God. Now, I'm being a little bit sort of strong here. There, there is um, some interpretation. There, are, there is some debate, but it's quite different from the Christian tradition uh, of the, of the Bible, in which there are many different versions of of similar events that are written by the different followers of Jesus, um, particularly in the New Testament. Also, the Bible has many different translations, many different interpretations, and there are whole, you know, scholarly fields of exegesis that are trying to explain the meaning of the Bible. So there's a very long tradition of scholarship that goes along with the Bible and interpretations of the Bible, lots and lots of debates um, as to the meaning of the Bible. And biblical translations are considered to be uh, sacred and important. Whereas with the Quran, again, you've got one version and you've got one translation. And that, tra I'm sorry, one, no translations. Uh, the Quran is written in Arabic and that is the official version of the Quran. And any, certainly there are translations of the Quran, but if you want to really know God's word and the full revelation of um, Muhammad's message, you need to learn Arabic and you need to read the Quran in Arabic. So for instance, we're reading an excerpt from the Quran in class for this module that's clearly translated into English so everyone can understand it. And yes, that will communicate the the message and the meaning, but if you really want to know the true word of God, you have to learn Arabic in order to read the Quran. So it's it's um, it's different in that sense from from the Bible. Uh, another oh, so let me just just uh, go back and kind of um, recoup what I, or not recoup uh, review what I just said. Uh, so Quran, the Quran is considered the word of Allah. There are virtually no translations, or certainly no translations that would be considered the same as the sacred text. And then no disputes over interpretation, or very, very few disputes over interpretation. Uh, here are some images of the Quran, and it's very beautiful in the way that it's uh, written out and constructed. Often, you'll see here there are relatively few words on on this, the page and then this really beautiful um, decoration around it, uh, revered as obviously as a, as a very sacred book in Islam. So those are some, some early examples. And again, you just see all the, the gold and the, the decoration around it, sort of the illuminated manuscripts. They have some of this kind of thing um, in Celtic uh, Ireland, the Celtic tradition would have some things like this. Anyway, uh, another sacred text in Islam is called the Hadith, and the Hadith is a collection of sayings that are attributed to Muhammad and stories about the deeds of his life. Um, these aren't considered the, the direct word of God, um, and in that sense they're not as indisputable as the Quran, and there is some debate over which versions of the Hadith are more true than others and over interpretations about the meanings, uh, the meaning and the veracity of, of various stories. So here you do have um, sort of more debate, more discussion. Here are some pages of the Hadith. And then finally you have a collection of laws that are called the um, Sharia. And these are the Sharia is basically a law code, and these are the laws by which uh, Muslims are supposed to live. These are the laws that are used in the, or were used in the court systems of the Islamic world, of the Islamic empires. And actually the judges who are called um, Qadis, it's Q-A-D-I-S, the judges in these court systems that were trained in Sharia law actually sort of um, act as as priests within Islam. It, the um, Islam does not have um, 
priests, basically. And so the Qadis kind of take that place, just as we saw with China, where the patriarch or the father figure kind of took the place of, or acted in a role of, of priest or sort of caretaker of, of religion in China, you see that with the Qadis, you see that with the, the judges, um, sort of legal experts in Islam. And so in that way you can see there's a very close relationship between law and religion within the Islamic uh, community. And some of those laws then include stipulations about lifestyle. Uh, within Islamic law, there's no drinking of alcohol that is allowed, no alcoholic beverages. In terms of marriage, traditionally uh, men can have up to four wives, women can have only one husband. Uh, but there is, divorce is legal and allowable. Women within this society then are subject to in many ways a very patriarchal society and we saw this uh, in China we saw this in Greece as well where the father and the husband um, sort of the patriarch of the of the family is the head of the family women are supposed to be subservient to men um, and men are to make sure that they protect women's honor and have the right to punish women who don't behave properly women in Islamic societies traditionally have been veiled but lest you start thinking that this is um, this very uh, kind of misogynistic or sort of women hating society um, there are very important protections and important rights for women within Islamic law as well and Muhammad taught very clearly that women needed to be treated with honor. He was very uh, loving toward his wife, very, um, he honored his, his wife, he honored Kaditha very much uh, in his life and in his teachings and taught that women needed to be treated respectfully and kindly by men. And so in Islam, men are supposed to do this and follow Muhammad's example in doing this. Uh, in Islamic law, women can participate in business, just like Muhammad's wife Kaditha did, was an important merchant. As I said a second ago, they have the right to divorce. Um, they also have the right to maintain control over their, um, their finances, particularly their dowries. A dowry was something that a woman's family would give to a woman upon her marriage, and often it would consist of quite a lot of um, money or very... Um, um, valuable goods and women controlled the right to this dowry throughout their lives whereas in medieval and early modern Europe women did not once they got married their husband controlled their dowries so that's an important difference uh, and also women have the right to inherit uh, somebody can will their goods to a woman again in medieval and early modern Europe women were not allowed to inherit goods uh, for the most part, there are some some nuances to that, but for the most part, women did not have uh, rights to enter business, they did not control their dowries, and they did not have the right to inherit in Europe, whereas under Islamic law, women did, and those are some very important rights and powers that women would have. Um, so, again, I want to try to... Um, avoid any kind of simplification about the place of women within the society. So anyway, those are the three main texts of Islam. And now I want to turn to some of the practices of Islam. Uh, and these practices are called the five pillars of Islam. They consist of five practices that every Muslim must do. Relatively simple, although not always easy to do, but easy to understand. Um, and a very clear set of practices that everybody can follow that really brings together this ummah, this, this community of, of Muslims. And it really helps to, these five pillars help to give unity um, to Islam. So despite the great variety of cultures that today comprise the ummah, the Muslim global community, all Muslims have to practice these five 
things. And again, that's what kind of brings them together. The first is they need to recite and believe that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Second, they need to pray to Allah five times daily while facing Mecca. So wherever you live in the world, five times a day, you need to take out a prayer rug, lay it down on the ground or on the floor, and facing Mecca. Um, wherever you are in the world, you need to face that way. So you, if you live west of Mecca, you need to face east. If you live south, you need to face north, etc. So you need to pray five times then facing Mecca. And in Islamic societies, there's actually a person called a muezzin who will call out, um, who will make the call to prayer five times a day and everybody stops, pulls out their prayer rug, kneels down and then and does their uh, prayer to Allah. And um, you can see here in this slide, then this is a picture of a mosque in present-day Medina and each mosque then has four towers that are called minarets. It's M-I-N-A-R-E-T is the word minaret. And the muezzin, it's M-U-E-Z-Z-I-N, will actually go up to the top. This is in the, the days before major loudspeakers and sound systems. The muezzin will go to the top of the minaret and call out throughout the city so that everybody knows when it's time for prayer. Nowadays they have it more on a loudspeaker and you'll hear in the video that you watch that goes along with this module, you'll hear the muezzin calling out, making the call for prayer. A very, very sacred time uh, for Muslims. So five times a day you do this prayer um, facing Mecca. And here are some images of these um, of prayer rugs that people will have to to do their prayers. A third pillar of Islam then is to fast during the month of Ramadan. So the, the month of Ramadan is um, the last month of the lunar year uh, in Islamic tradition and during that time it's basically I think it's in like August sort of around the months of August and September uh, during this time, then during the month of Ramadan, Muslims are supposed to refrain from eating or drinking during daylight hours. And then throughout the, the month you perform all sorts of, sort of special rituals and saying special prayers uh, in order to honor Allah. And the idea is that it's sort of easier to um, to get rid of sin and to enter heaven during this month. And so it's sort of a period of, of particularly intense religious worship. And here is a, a Ramadan checklist <coughs> for um, for Muslims during, during this month. For instance, um, there's a whole series of activities here. And then you're supposed to uh, check it off for each day of the month of Ramadan. Um, did you pray... Uh, did you do did you do these particular prayers? Did you read the Quran? Uh, did you memorize a part of the Quran? Did you attend a study circle? Um, did you protect your tongue from ill speech? Did you fast? So you can see there's a whole series of basically activities and special activities that you're supposed to do during this this holy time. Uh, here's another. Um, advertisement for various Ramadan celebrations. This is from Leeds, so this is a, from from England. But this is a, um, a timetable then. This includes a timetable for fasting and prayers and when you're supposed to do certain things and you know when you need to stop eating at sunrise and when you can start eating again at sunset. So it's taken very, very seriously as you can see here. Uh, a fourth pillar of Islam then is that you need to give charity for relief of the sick, the poor, and the helpless. And this was the idea of, of charitable giving, alms giving, and being kind and charitable to other people uh, was very important to Muhammad, having grown up as an orphan. And this was a really important part of his kind of religious program to make sure to give to the helpless within the community and, and make sure that the community supported 
the helpless. Um, this is really important to him because of his experiences of helplessness as, as an orphan. So uh, charity, benevolence, kindness, and generosity, those are important parts of uh, Islamic practice. And then the fifth pillar of Islam is that if you are able, if you are financially and physically capable, uh, you need to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. You basically need to make a trip to Mecca and when you get to Mecca, you go to the Kaaba. You remember the black, the shrine with the big black rock that um, Muhammad had circled around, had made basically a, a pilgrimage to, in the symbolic kind of um, victory over polytheism, over idolatry for Muslims, for for um, for Muhammad. Uh, so what what Muhammad taught was that if you're able to you need to go to Mecca and you need to also make that same pilgrimage and circle around the Kaaba in order to um, symbolize and proclaim the victory of, of Islam. And so every Muslim if they are able is supposed to at least one time in their life make this pilgrimage, make this trip to Mecca and then circle around the Kaaba seven times and people are doing this all the time and you can see the throngs of crowds this is this is sort of the ultimate um, holy experience for a Muslim and again Muslims coming from all over the Muslim world coming together and then circling the Kaaba and only Muslims are ever supposed to go into um, into this very sacred area and circle around so here are some images again of uh, this is the Kaaba and then this is um, it's located now in, in this very large mosque but then then you can see people going around the circle here you can see the, the crowds here you really get a kind of a sense of it and it must be an amazing experience I think you know you could have people from literally all over the world they're coming together in this very sacred special experience and that helped to reinforce the sense of an Islamic community as well. And I just want to show you this slide of various pilgrimage routes to Mecca. When we talk about the Islamic world system in a, in a little while, I'll talk about how important the pilgrimage was to um, the, the creation and reinforcement of these routes, which were also trade routes within the Islamic world and again how this helped to reinforce an Islamic community. But you can see lots of different routes sort of leading into um, Mecca, where is it? <laughs> right here. Uh, sort of leading into Mecca, bringing people to to this area. So it really helped to stimulate not only a sense of community but also um, the infrastructure to allow this to take place. I'm just going to show you about a minute's worth of a video of people who are who have performed that pilgrimage and are walking around the Kaaba, which actually I didn't say uh, is called the Hajj, H-A-J-J. -J. So the pilgrimage to Mecca is actually referred to as the Hajj. So I'm going to show you about a one minute video of people performing the Hajj, circling around the Kaaba, and you can I would take note of you know the people walking around the atmosphere of the place the juxtaposition of of the Kaaba with this sort of big city um, the big city buildings behind it and then also people um, who are right near the Kaaba trying to to touch it again a very sacred thing um, in in Islam I think you'll see it's it's really interesting it's also kind of loud. I don't know how it's exactly going to record how loud it will be in your recording so you may want to turn the volume down. <laughs> I've tried to do that here but again I don't know exactly how that works but it's the, the murmur of the voices of all these thousands of people is actually really loud in the video at least on my computer so anyway so so here it is.
So you can you can see in that video then how many just how many people are there circling the Kaaba and also how people are really kind of jostling to try to get to the Kaaba to be able to to touch it um, in that video. So I thought that that was really interesting and very enlightening. I think to see it to see what we're talking about with the Hajj. So um, now back to I want to transition then back to kind of the story of the development and spread of Islam. So we sort of took a few minutes to talk about the pra the the sacred text and then the practices of Islam, but now I want to go back to the end of Muhammad's life and then what happens with Islam following his death because it basically expands dramatically following his death. So that's what we're going to focus on now. So as I said, Muhammad dies in the year 632 AD. And when he dies, it actually leads to some problems with succession. There's some debate as to who should succeed him as the leader of this Islamic Ummah. And what the, the main uh, elders, the main leaders of the Ummah decide is that nobody can be a prophet. So the next leader cannot be called the prophet since Muhammad is is Allah's fourth and final prophet. So what they decide is that the leaders of the Muslim community from now on will be called caliphs, which basically means deputy. It's the idea that, that they're standing in for Muhammad, that they are the deputy of Muhammad's message. But the question remains, who should rule? And there are two main candidates uh, in mind. The Muslim community has two main candidates in mind. One of them is a man named Abu Bakir, who is Muhammad's friend, very close friend, and um, and one of his most loyal disciples. And this is an image of Abu Bakir. And then another man named Ali, who was Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law. Uh, Abu Bakir gets chosen as the next caliph, or as the first caliph, actually, as, as Muhammad's successor. But the supporters of Ali refuse to recognize him or refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the caliphs that come after him because they believe that Ali should be the deputy, the next caliph, because he was a blood relative of Muhammad, whereas Abu Bakr was not related to him by blood. And so actually the followers of Ali and the people who thought Ali should be the first caliph um, s split from the larger Muslim community and to this day are known as Shia Muslims. The majority of Muslims are known as Sunnis and then this group that was loyal to Ali is known as the Shias or the Shiite Muslims. So you may have heard of this term before um, and this is where it comes from. So here's an image of Ali and again Sunni Muslims then are the majority of Muslims and this these were the supporters of Abu Bakr of his succession and then the Shia were which means basically party these were the supporters of Ali and so there was a major schism within the Muslim community that still exists to this day the dark green area here is um, where you have uh, Shia Muslims so there's there are sort of pockets of them throughout the Ummah, but the majority of Muslims then are the Sunni Muslims, which is the lighter green area. But this is just to give you a sort of a look at it in the present day in the Islamic world, where the Sunnis and the, the Shiite Muslims are, are largely located. But back to the story then. Um, so Abu Bakr becomes the caliph for the majority of the Muslim community. Um, some problems with this early succession, but these succession problems were, were relatively short-lived because in 661 AD the Islamic realm is taken over by a very powerful family called the Umayyads and they begin to aggressively expand the territory of the Islamic community and um, from 661 to 750 AD they are able to spread Islamic rule uh, from the Arabian Peninsula west 
across North Africa. Let me get my little pen. So they're able to spread out from here, the sort of core area of the Arabian Peninsula, of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. They're able to spread west along North Africa. And then in 711, they actually uh, cross the Straits of Gibraltar and enter uh, Spain, enter Western Europe through Spain, and are able to conquer most of the Iberian Peninsula. They also expand east through the former Persian Empire as far as the Indus River Valley in uh, northern India, or basically India and present-day Pakistan. So they are able to, to spread far and wide very quickly. This, is, this happens in less than a hundred years. So it's really sort of an explosive development. They also establish a capital city in the city of Damascus here. I'll show you where Damascus, this is a modern day map of, of Damascus in, the, um, in Syria. And so the question then is why? Why were the Umayyads able to expand so far so quickly? Um, there's several different reasons for it that largely revolve around this first reason that I'm going to give, which is that they basically took over empires that were very weak or in decline. Um, particularly the Byzantine Empire that we talked about following um, sort of the, the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, they took over parts of the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire, which had, was basically a successor to the Persian Empire, kind of located in this sort of region around here of, of modern day Iran. So they were able to take over empires that were in decline and they used the infrastructure of these empires, basically the roads, the transport systems, the systems of tax collection, um, the administrative systems of these older empires, they just basically kept them in place and just used them to be able to rule these lands they had recently taken over. They also tended to leave people relatively alone when they would come to a new area. They would leave the former system in place and let people continue to govern themselves. So they were not particularly repressive. Um, and on the other hand, they also provided newfound stability, unity, and safety in these regions. So they were often welcomed by people who were living in these former crumbling empires where things were starting to get out of control. The Umayyads came in, were not particularly uh, oppressive, and provided some safety and some stability. And so those are, that's sort of the main, those are the main reasons why they were able to expand so far so quickly. But their caliphate or their empire was relatively short-lived. Within 90 years, it had basically collapsed and was taken over by another dynasty, by another ruling family, we'll see in just a second. Um, and so again, why so short-lived? They expanded so quickly, why didn't they stay in power? There's basically two main reasons for that. In the first place, the Umayyads tended to favor Arab peoples, peoples of, of Arab ethnicity, of Arab descent, and they did relatively little to try to attract their um, the people they recently con conquered to Islam. They didn't promote uh, widespread incorporation into an Islamic society. There was not a lot of imperial coordination it was basically a realm that was expanding very, very quickly, but not doing much to consolidate these conquests. And also, as they expanded further and further, the rulers tended to get more decadent. And so people within the realms who originally had welcomed them started to grow um, dissatisfied with Umayyad rule. And this leads to rebellion. So basically, two reasons for decline were uh, favoritism of Arab peoples, and then along with that, um, not much effort was put in to try to consolidate their rule and bring people into this Islamic community. So that's sort of one main reason. And then the second reason, the rulers basically grew decadent, um, corrupt, and didn't provide very good leadership anymore. So uh, in the year 750, there's a major rebellion that's led by a na man named Abu al-Abbas and he's able to successfully throw off the Umayyad 
rulers and establish the Abbasid Caliphate. I'll show you that in just a second so you know how to spell it and everything, but now I just want to show a few pictures so the, of the Umayyad Caliphate. So here is, again, the city of Damascus, and then here are some major monumental constructions that went on during the Umayyad period in Damascus. There's a, a great mosque, very beautiful mosque. Here's a gate um, in the wall surrounding the city. Here's another view of, of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. Okay, and so as I said a second ago, this a man from the Abbasid family rises up in a rebellion, overthrows Umayyad rule, and establishes what is known as the Abbasid Caliphate, or the Abbasid Empire, you can think of it that way, which was sort of a successor to the Umayyad Empire, still an Islamic Empire, ruling over um, basically the same area. But this lasts over 500 years, from 750 AD to 1258, when it is taken over by Mongols, uh, Mongol rulers. And the Abbasid Caliphate was actually very successful in many ways. As you can see, it lasted 500 years, and it had an imperial policy that was quite different from the Umayyads. The Abbasids consciously constructed different policies from the Umayyads. Did I say the Abbasids? Okay, let me say that again. The Abbasids consci consciously constructed different policies than those of the Umayyads. They had seen what had gone wrong, and they said, we're not going to do the same thing. Uh, in the first place, they, worked, they focused on consolidating the empire rather than expansion. As you can see, the Abbasid Caliphate doesn't really, um, isn't too much different, isn't too much bigger than the Umayyad Caliphate. And that's because the Abbasids didn't concentrate on, on expansion, they concentrated on consolidation. Um, they worked on trying to establish very uh, efficient administrative systems that would bring the empire together. And in a similar way, they were much more inclusive than the Umayyads had been. People within the Abbasid Empire were encouraged to convert to Islam, and the Abbasids didn't overtly favor Arabs as much as had been done during the, the Umayyads. Oh, hold on just a second, the phone's ringing. Okay, so as I was saying then, the Abbasids didn't overtly favor uh, the Arab populations as much within their empire. And they were, they were very successful in what they did. Uh, they stayed in power for several centuries, and they established a capital city in the city of Baghdad. They actually moved their capital city from Damascus to Baghdad. And Baghdad became a center of intellectual achievement, of the development of the arts. Um, the, the Abbasids did a lot to support learning in the arts. So here is a map then of, you should probably recognize this area here, uh, Mesopotamia. This is where ancient Sumer was located. So here's Baghdad located on the Euphrates River. And uh, here's an image of modern Baghdad. Again, for some of you, this may look familiar who have been in Iraq. Anyway, so Baghdad was an ancient, uh, beautiful capital city that supported learning in the arts. Here's the palace of the Abbasid caliphs. Um, here's a drawing of the Abbasid court at Baghdad. And as I said, the caliphs supported learning in the arts. They established a library that was called the House of Wisdom, where scholars came from all over the caliphate to this library where they studied, and they also translated many ancient Greek, Indian, and Persian texts in a very important translation movement that in many ways preserved a lot of these texts. They would have been lost otherwise. Texts written by uh, Aristotle, for example, that would have been lost if the Abbasids hadn't put so many resources into trying to preserve and translate these works. And then once the scholars had translated these works, then they built upon them. And so 
uh, in the Islamic world you see the development of an amazing project of scientific learning and also learning in medicine and in addition to this actually let me show you one other image so here's another image of the house of wisdom where you have a lot of studies in astronomy taking place as well as medicine mathematics and navigational technologies uh, as you'll see in a second they also built beautiful mosques so here's a mosque in Baghdad uh, here is some more beautiful examples of Abbasid architecture also Baghdad is where the Arabian Nights was written the thousand and one nights classic stories uh, and finally the Abbasid Empire was a place of relative tolerance Abbasids allowed non-Muslims and non-Arabs to live within the empire without any kind of persecution. Um, Non-Muslims didn't have to convert to Islam, and there was um, especially a respect shown toward people that they called the peoples of the book, so the Jews and the Christians with whom they shared that uh, religious history and the, the historical traditions they tended to show uh, a lot of respect to toward Jews and Christians although we don't want to romanticize it too much there certainly was pressure to convert to Islam and it was preferred if you were to convert to Islam and people had to pay a tax if you didn't convert you had to pay um, a, a special sort of religious tax because you hadn't become a Muslim but on the other hand people weren't expelled from these territories they weren't persecuted and they weren't killed which is what you see uh, happening in Spain once Christians retake the Iberian Peninsula um, several centuries later then they do persecute people who don't uh, convert to Christianity and they also expel people from the peninsula as well so in that sense the Abbasids were uh, relatively tolerant now the dynasty lasts until the year 1258 AD but the Abbasids actually lost power well before that it's a lot like the Zhou dynasty in China which you saw if you remember that they had been in power for about 500 years but the first 300 years of their rule was was quite effective but the last sort of 200 is when China falls into that period of warring states where the Zhou were nominally in charge but really um, but in in practice and in actual fact they weren't and there was a lot of of warring among those different the different states among the different dynasties that controlled those states um, a somewhat similar thing takes place with the Abbasid Empire where they have effective rule until about 950 or you can think of it as a thousand AD uh, but then uh, Turkish people actually come move into the empire and really start to control the crown so for the last about 200 years 250 years the Abbasids um, in in practice really lose control and it's these um, Turkish sultans that sort of control the empire so effectively by a thousand AD Abbasid control is is very weak and again it's controlled by these these Turkish sultans but in name the Abbasids stay in power so officially the Abbasids are in power till 1258 when they are defeated by Mongols but in actual practice um, they lose control much sooner and with that I will turn to then a discussion of Islam as a, as a world system this is the Islamic world as a world system so now we're moving into the later part of the development of the Islamic world basically from about a thousand to about 1500 AD or, or the of the common era and this anticipates and overlaps with some of what I'm going to be talking about in the last module in module 11 so this will 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 sound familiar when we get to module 11 we'll reprise some of this but I want to introduce the idea now so as I said we're moving into the period between 1000 and 1500 AD and this is really the period following the decline of Abbasid power where you have an Islamic world that continues and actually continues to grow even after the Abbasids 
basically fall from power even though they're in power in name until 1258 AD by 1000 AD really their power is is pretty much defunct yet the Islamic world continues to thrive and it's been called an Islamic world system or um, some people have argued that it's a, a special world system so what is a world system in the first place and then how and why is the Islamic world system a special world system I'll talk about all of this um, I'll define this for you in just a second I want to start by saying in this period between 1000 and 1500 AD you've actually got several different kind of world systems or, or large kind of imperial or economic systems that are emerging in Afro-Eurasia you've got the Islamic world you've also got the Mongolian empires that are spreading across Eurasia in the 14th century in China then following the Mongol empires you've got the development of, of the Ming dynasty which really expands Chinese power and then starting in the late uh, you could say mid to late 1400s you've got the beginnings of the expansion of Western Europe particularly out into the Atlantic and also uh, into the Indian Ocean and that's what the P Spanish and the Portuguese um, largely characterized by the voyages of Christopher Columbus so those that's the subject for module 11 um, but we're gonna as I said sort of start it up here by talking about the Islamic world system so what is the, the world system I've been talking about um, actually let me go back for a second so what is this so what is this world system that I keep talking about what is a world system a world system is basically um, a system of shared values shared understandings um, a social political and economic region that unites a major portion of the world in a kind of a shared understanding it's basically when lots of different people from a um, from several different regions that span a very large area uh, come together in some sort of political economic religious system in which there's shared understanding communication and exchange um, so it's basically like a very large empire a very large economic system and people who have written about world systems have characterized them for the early modern and the modern world as being of two different kinds in fact the person who came up with kind of world systems theory is a man named Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, w-a-l-l-e-r-s-t-e-i-n anyway Emmanuel Wallerstein kind of came up with this this idea of a, a world system and what Wallerstein argued was that there were two different kinds of world systems there were systems that he called world empires which basically consisted of very large empires and we've seen some examples of what he would have labeled world empires in this class already if you can think of some think for a second yes the Roman Empire would be a great example of a world empire and also the Han Empire and also you could talk about the Hellenistic uh, empires as a world system kind of a, a Hellenistic world empire also the Persian Empire which we haven't really we've only touched on that briefly with regard to Greece um, would have been another example so these are and if you, you think back these are empires that covered a very large area of the globe Rome sort of encircles the Mediterranean for example or the Islamic world which extends from the Iberian Peninsula to India they cover a very large sort of swath of the globe um, and integrate lots of, of different regions together another type of world system then was a world economy which for Wallerstein there was sort of one true world system that's developed in the modern world and that is the capitalist world system which really begins he argues at about 1500 and continues into the present day um, so a capitalist sort of world economy but other scholars have argued then that there was uh, a different that there's a, a third alternative there's a third type of world system that develops oh, there's the phone again just a second okay sorry lots of phone calls today 
Anyway, um, so Wallerstein had argued that there were world empires and world economies, but other scholars more recently have argued that there's actually another alternative. Um, there's another kind of world system that can be that that has developed, and that's characterized by the Islamic world system. And they've said that that in this way, the Islamic world system is a is a special world system, because it isn't a world economy after 1000 AD. Once the Abbasids really decline from power, you don't truly have a world empire anymore in the Abbasid Empire. And the Islamic world system was not a world economy. This is not a capitalist world economy. Yet, as I said a minute ago, the Islamic world clearly holds together uh, and, and interactions uh, and communications within the Islamic Empire, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, within the Islamic world continue to grow and intensify even after the fall of the Abbasids. And so how do you explain this? It's no longer a world empire after 1000 AD. It's not a world economy, yet it holds together as a world system, as a system of exchange. And so what um, one particular author has argued is that Islam is a special world system that's held together by what he calls a shared discourse, which is really sort of a set of, of shared ideas and shared understandings that is evident through Islamic writings, through um, Islamic sort of systems of understanding, common beliefs, common laws like the Sharia law, uh, and common practices like the five pillars of Islam. And so in this way, again, the Islamic world system from 1000 to 1500 AD, it wasn't a world economy, it's not a, a world empire, yet it's still a world system and it's sort of a special world system uh, based upon shared discourse and that largely stems from their common religious belief and religious practice, a common culture. And I'm going to build on this today uh, by talking about three different areas in which you can see the Islamic world system intensifying and building during this this period. And I'm going to show, uh, look at three different areas. We're going to look at trade, we're going to look at education, and we're going to look at religious practices as areas in which you see the growth and development of an Islamic world system again between 1000 and 1500 AD. And this is going to be a prelude leading up to um, the Western European voyages of expansion as well. We're going to see the, the basis for the building of these world systems, of these kind of special world systems, uh, using Islam as, as sort of an, the earliest example. So let's look at trade. Uh, trade during the period 1000 to 1500 AD increases and continues to increase and intensify even after, as I said, the sort of the decline of the Abbasids. And in particular, you see trade in the Indian Ocean and uh, trade routes established within the Indian Ocean. Uh, really intensified during this period for a, for a number of different reasons. Uh, here is a slide showing you the various trade routes throughout the Indian Ocean. We've seen this again with the Silk Roads. We've seen these these um, these various sea routes. They should look uh, relatively familiar by now. Um, and the trade, the main point here is that the the trade along these routes intensifies um, during the period that we're talking about, and it was, it intensified for a couple of different reasons. I had talked earlier about how uh, there had been a long history of trade within the Indian Ocean because the wind patterns, the weather patterns in the Indian Ocean were very dependable, um, particularly because of uh, a wind pattern called the monsoon winds. Between the months of April and September, you have monsoon winds that basically travel in this direction, kind of from, uh, what would that be, southwest to kind of northeast. So they sort of sweep across the Indian Ocean in this direction. And then between Feb uh, November and February, they reverse course, they reverse direction, and these winds sweep along this way. So if you are a navigator, it's actually going to be 
pretty easy, relatively easy, to cross the Indian Ocean because you can count on these winds. And so navigators were actually uh, willing and able to leave sight of land, for instance, with this particular trade route because they could, they knew that they could depend upon these wind patterns. So the monsoon winds aided had always aided actually travel within the Indian Ocean and allowed it to intensify during this period. And these were actually called the monsoon routes. But there's this, also a series of technologies that developed during this period that allowed for increasing intensification of trade within this area. And these developed within the Islamic world. Um, oh, this is one, one other um, image of the, these, these sort of traditional trade routes across the Indian Ocean. So there's a number of, as I said, navigational uh, breakthroughs or improvements that allowed for the uh, increasing trade within the Indian Ocean. And they come from, from all over, you'll see. In the first place, you have the development of the compass from China that uh, Islamic sailors, navigators start to incorporate into the Indian Ocean trade. So they, they take this technology, they borrow it from China, um, and that uh, the compass uh, allows you to know what direction you're going in. So here's an example of, of a compass. In addition to the compass, the Greeks had developed something called the astrolabe, which was an instrument that you could use to determine your latitude, sort of the latitude of um, of your ship within the ocean based upon the position of the stars. You could use this instrument to pinpoint where a star was or using the position of uh, where a particular star was in the sky you could use that then to determine your position in the ocean and you can see that in this slide. So here's an example of an astrolabe. Uh, here's a little another little compass right in the middle. And then here is a navigator using the astrolabe. So again, this in this particular instance, they're using the position of the sun. And then from that, they can um, measure their position, then their latitude within the, the ocean. The main point is, for this is just to know that with the astrolabe, you can determine your, your latitude. So it helps them to know where they are. And then with the compass, it helps them to know where they're going. Um, and then a final navigational improvement was the use, the, the adoption of the Latin sail, which is a triangular sail that Indian navigators used. And the advantage of using a, a Latin or a triangular sail was that it allowed for increased speed and maneuverability. You could take advantage of winds, you could ride really close to winds and take advantage of the winds to give you the best kind of speed while you're sailing, but also you could maneuver quite easily, or much more easily with a Latin sail than with a, a square sail. So these are three navigational improvements that were adopted again from the Chinese, the Greeks, and the Indians by Islamic sailors to trade within the Indian Ocean. And the reason why I'm spending quite a bit of time on this is you're going to see this technology then transferred to the Mediterranean and then to the Atlantic in, in Module 11. But this is where it's getting set up during the Islamic, um, the, this period of uh, the intensification of the Islamic world. So here is a slide showing you then what a Latin sail looks like. It should look pretty familiar. This is what, you know, sailboats use uh, to this day. Here are some examples of um, ships in the Indian Ocean called dhows that have the Latin sail. So this is Indian Ocean uh, sailing. And then here's some more dhows with the Latin sail. Uh, and then this is a slide showing uh, navigators or astron astronomers basically working in the House of Wisdom uh, working on navigational improvements, working on increased um, as knowledge of astronomy, which will then help with navigation. Uh, another innovation then that helped with trade was uh, a series of actually innovations in Islamic business practices, uh, and this helped to facilitate trade. In the first place, you start to see the formation of corporations, which is 
basically groups of investors. Um, merchants would form corporations in order to decrease risk with their investments. And they would do this because, say you were a merchant and you wanted to, you were living in the Arabian Peninsula and you wanted to buy pepper from India. And you invest your life savings on a shipment of, of pepper. So you, you pay for all this pepper that's going to be shipped to you from India and then you're going to sell it and you're going to make a huge profit from this. But say the ship sinks while it's um, you know crossing the Indian, Indian Ocean along these monsoon routes and your entire life savings is, is wiped out. Your business is wiped out. You're, you know, you're in big trouble. So what happened in the Islamic world was that instead of just having one merchant say purchase an entire shipment of pepper, the merchants would form corporations where you might have a hundred or five hundred different merchants who would then each invest a smaller amount of money. Maybe instead of your life savings, you might invest, you know, a few would be the equivalent of, you know, a hundred dollars or something like that. I mean, this is totally anachronistic, but <laughs> but to give you the idea, you would invest some sum of money. But then if that ship sank, okay, you're out a hundred dollars. That's not very nice, but you haven't invested your entire uh, your entire life savings in this. So merchants again would form corporations or groups to try to, to decrease risk. Another thing that helped to decrease risk was that you have the establishment of banks within the Islamic world. Um, institutions basically where you could put your money and it would be safe and then you could actually write checks on the money from the banks so you didn't have to pay for things in cash. So within the Islamic world, the um, a system of check writing evolves, which again is much safer. If you go, say, to pay your rent or to pay your mortgage, you don't get that money out in cash and then carry it with you to go pay it. I mean, you might, but I think most of us uh, would write a check. Uh, in or, and that's, that's much safer than carrying cash. If you lose your cash, it's gone. If you lose the check, well, you can have the payment stopped on that check, and you don't necessarily you wouldn't you wouldn't lose that money. Also, um, banks would lend money to um, people who wanted to uh, create a business, who wanted to be entrepreneurial. They would also exchange currency, which is extremely important and helpful. And they themselves, banks, would also invest in trade. One more sort of innovation in business practices uh, in the Islamic world was that um, they adopted the Indian numerals. Do you remember we talked about that uh, in India, where the in sort of the classical age of India, they had developed what we call Arabic numerals. They're actually Indian numerals. And then uh, the Arab world, or the Abbasid, uh, Empire actually adopts these these numerals, and then during this period of the expansion of the Islamic world system, uh, Islamic businessmen would and women would use these these Indian numbers to really simplify their their bookkeeping practices. Um, so I said that in a very long-winded way, but basically people within the Islamic world started to use Indian numerals. It's the same numbers that we call Arabic numerals. They began to use Indian numerals that really helped to, sig to simplify their bookkeeping. And then finally, the sort of final po um, point with regard to trade in the Islamic world is that with this intensification of trade, this helps to spread Islamic values and Islamic ideas too. When you have Islamic merchants who then live in port cities throughout the Indian Ocean world, um, they would marry into local communities, establish ties with these communities, and often the religion would spread this way. That's what happens uh, all along the coast of East Africa where you have um, Muslim communities um, established due to this Indian Ocean trade. Okay, so another area that demonstrates sort of the intensification of the Islamic world system and also helps to explain why this was happening between 1000 and 1500 AD 
is the education systems that were put forth by uh, in the Islamic world. In the first place, mosques were built all over is the Islamic realms and mosques usually had elementary schools attached to them. Uh, beginning with the Abbasid Empire you also have the establishment of something called the Madrasa which was basically an institution of higher learning or, or, or what we would call a university and these actually formed the basis for European universities and then uh, San Diego State University is is sort of a, a descendant of these these madrasas too, arguably. Uh, and by the 12th century in the Islamic world, so by the 1100s there were madrasas in virtually every major Islamic city in the Islamic world. So these um, educational institutions also helped to spread the uh, values and the teachings of the Islamic world and, and establish a common understanding within this, this world system. And, oh, let me show you some slides then of some madrasas. So this is a madrasa at Samarkand, which was, if you remember, along the Silk Roads, it was one of those oasis towns. So you can see now the spread of Islam along the, the Silk Roads. Here's a madrasa in Bosnia, a modern day, obviously. <laughs> uh, okay, and then the final point I want to make about the sort of final reasons why the Islamic world system was able to function and grow and intensify during this period was due to the religious beliefs and practices within the Islamic world. In the first place you have Sufi missionaries. Uh, Sufis were basically mis mystic leaders uh, who in their teachings they tended to emphasize practice over doctrine. They tended to be very charismatic leaders who would travel throughout the Islamic world to gain followers. They were very popular and they often encouraged conversion. They were so popular and charismatic that wherever they went people tended to convert to Islam and, and follow them. And then in that way they helped to spread again Islamic values throughout the Islamic world. And then a second uh, aspect of religion get to in just a second. These are this is a, an image of them, these Sufi missionaries, sort of mystic, mystic uh, religious leaders. And then a second reason uh, why Islamic religion helped to promote the Islamic world system has to do with pilgrimage, with the Hajj, that pilgrimage to Mecca, which as we saw is one of the five pillars of Islam. And this helped to reinforce the Islamic world system because it led to enhanced infrastructure for trade and travel. I had sort of mentioned this a bit earlier. Um, because people needed to travel to Mecca on a regular basis, uh, leaders would build roads, they would establish inns, they would police the routes in order to protect the travelers along the, the routes. And this helped, again, to build an infrastructure, to build a, a, a road system, and a network of communication throughout the Islamic realms to be able to get people to Mecca safely. And again, this is going to help with trade as well. So it, 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 um, it affects trade, but uh, it really helps to lead to infrastructure. And finally, the pilgrimage to Mecca also helped to create a cultural unity, a common identity within the Islamic world. It leads to a shared experience, to a common understanding of Islam. You've got people from all over the Islamic world who meet up at this place, who can share their stories and experience this very um, this sacred place together and it gives reality to the meaning of this Islamic community of this of this Ummah that has has developed and so these are the things that help to create and reinforce the unity within the Islamic world system and give reality to that world system as a special world system again not as a world empire or world economy 
but as something that was a special world system of kind of shared understanding. So with that then I will conclude the lecture for Module 9.